going on a trip. <laughs> going on a trip, guys. Uh, this week, I actually am going on a trip. I'll be leaving sometime this afternoon, this evening. I'll be going up to Moberly, Missouri, because I got a class this week. So while you guys are at work or at home or whatever you're doing this week, I'll be spending 40 hours sitting in a chair listening to someone lecture eight hours a day for five days this coming week. So if you think about me, please pray for me because I will be dying inside. <laughs> when I was younger, my family used to actually take uh, a lot of trips, usually up to uh, northeast Ohio near Cleveland because we had some relatives in the area. Now the drive from my hometown to Cleveland was around about eight hours. My dad had this really weird thing I didn't understand until I got older where he would always want to leave at 3 or 3.30 in the morning, every time. And I always thought it was like, all right, because if we leave at 3 and we make it there in 8 hours, and we'll get there at 11, or if it takes us a little bit longer, we might get there at like 12, and he'll get to spend more time with his cousins and uncles and, and all that, right? I always thought it was like he wanted to spend more time with the family. I realized as I got older that was not actually why he wanted to leave at 3 in the morning. Some of you are giggling because you're like, your parents and you know. He wanted to leave at three in the morning because he had four children. <laughs> and his four children were not going to be awake at three in the morning. He could pile us in the car, we'd all fall asleep again, and he would get some peace and quiet for three or four hours until we woke up. And then even after we woke up, road trips are kind of fun for the first hour that you're conscious, right? You're like, oh, look at the mountains, look at the trees, oh, I think I saw a deer. And we got to cross the Ohio River, and because like children are easily entertained, actually I'm an adult and I'm still easily entertained, was we're crossing the Ohio River, we're like, whoa, look at how big it is! And I'm like so impressed, so I'm not really a problem for about an hour after I wake up. That means that in a nine or so hour trip, my dad only really has to put up with us being annoying for three or four hours. So he always left at 3.30 in the morning. Now, when we did get to that point in time where we were no longer amused, we were fully conscious, and we were going to be irritating, we always said just about the same thing to him. We'd look at him, and we'd say, Dad! Are we there yet? Are, are we, how, how far are we? Dad, are we there yet? He always said the same thing. Didn't matter how far we were from Cleveland, he always said the exact same thing. He'd do the little dad look, like you guys all know it, because one of your parents did this, maybe it was your dad, maybe it was your mom. But they did the little dad look where you looked in the rear view mirror and still caught your eye and just stared into your soul. <laughs> He'd say, five more minutes. When I was young, I made the mistake of believing him. Like when I was really little, like the first couple times we went up, I'd be like, oh, five more minutes, awesome. I must have slept like all day. We're almost there. We're gonna get to see my cousins. It's gonna be so much fun. And then I'd see a sign that said, welcome to Ohio. And I was like, wow. I didn't realize Cleveland was so close to the border of Ohio. And it is, just not the border we were crossing. <laughs> about four hours left. Usually after about a half hour after dad says five more minutes, you're like, I don't think he was telling the truth. <laughs> Eventually, I figured out when dad says five more minutes, he doesn't literally mean five more minutes. The point he is trying to make, somewhat sarcastically, is we're still on the road, we're still driving, we'll get there soon. We're still on the road, we're still driving, and we'll get there soon. Now, I tell this story because I do think it has some significance to our growth as Christians, to our walk with Jesus. You see, many of us, when we first came to know Jesus, maybe it was a very short period of time ago, maybe it was decades ago, but each one of us, when we come to Jesus, we usually become aware of one or two or three big things in our life that need to change. Maybe it's an issue with gossip. Maybe that's just, that's your big sin, your big issue. That's the thing that when you read the scriptures, when you hear sermons, when you pray, then you know this is something that needs to be sorted out in your life. For many of us, if you're anything like me, maybe it was an issue with anger. That whether it's uh, verbal arguments or physical fights, I got into a lot of fights when I was little, uh, when I was younger, middle school, high school, I got into a lot of fights because I had an issue with anger. I didn't know how to control it, and so that's something that I've had to figure out in my walk with Jesus. Maybe you were like that, either verbal arguments or physical fights, or maybe just a rage that you, you didn't really show, you didn't express it, but there was always some sort of anger at other people, people in your family or friends. There's some sort of anger under the surface that you know you needed to get rid of, or maybe it was a lack of of generosity, that you were very uh, tight with your money either because of a circumstance when you were younger, maybe you grew up without much money and so you find it difficult to give to others. 
But often, if you follow Jesus long enough, and if you follow him earnestly, you find that over time you confront these issues. Scriptures speak to your issue with anger or your lack of generosity. In your prayers, God convicts you, and over time, with your effort and the blessing of the Holy Spirit, often we get past these big issues. Many of you have probably experienced that in your life. There's something that you did 20 years ago that doesn't trouble you today. And that's terrific. But there's a little bit of trouble that comes with that. You see, when we overcome these big things in life, we often are tempted to believe there's nothing more to work on. Now, I think if I asked each one of you individually, you'd say, no, I'm not perfect. Like, there's still things I need to work on. But if I walked up to you and I asked you, all right, what do you need to do today to get closer to Jesus, to be more like him than you were yesterday, many of you would look at me and would say, uh? Because once you get those big things out of the way, you know, the gossip, the anger, the lack of generosity, whatever that big thing was for you, it requires a little bit more effort to figure out how to take the next step on your journey with Christ, right? You're halfway through the road trip, and you wake up, and you look at Jesus, and you say, Jesus, how much further? Are we there yet? Have I made it? And if you listen closely, you'll probably hear Jesus say, five more minutes. The point is, even when you get those big things out of the way, you're just halfway through the road trip, and no one pulls over on the side of the road somewhere in West Virginia and rolls out a tent and says, we're staying here, this is Cleveland now. Don't do that. Have you seen Deliverance? It's just, (laughs) sorry, that was mean. If anyone's from West Virginia, I apologize a little bit. But no one does that, right? You don't quit halfway through a road trip, and you can't quit halfway through your journey with Jesus. This is a temptation that we have today. This is a temptation that Christians had in the first century as well, which is why Paul writes about it in the book of Philippians. Today we'll be in chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Don't quit halfway through the journey. That's the point of this pericope, this passage that we'll be reading today. Starting in verse 12, Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained all of this, or that I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, as I preach, I want to teach you guys how to read your Bible well, okay? I want to give you little tips, little tricks as I preach to teach you guys how to read the Bible. One of them is that when you run into words like this or that, these words, they're called demonstrative pronouns. It's a fancy grammar nerd term. A a word that refers back to something beforehand. Well, go figure out what that word is referring to. Here's what I mean. If I'm talking to my wife and I say, oh, hey, Maggie, um, the hinge on the cabinet's broken. We should really fix that. When I say the word that, what am I referring to? the hinge on the cabinet, right? What I, what I just said. There's something I said before that I'm now referring to in shorthand, right? And that's what Paul's doing here. He uses the term this and that to refer to something he just said. So when you're reading scripture, especially if you're just reading one or two verses in isolation, and you see terms like this, and you go, what on earth is Paul or James or John, what are they talking about? Go back a couple verses and look for it. So if we want to understand Philippians 3.12, we need to read something that we heard last week. So let's go back. Just two verses, Philippians 3.10 through 11, reads this way. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, to become like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, all that, all those things I just said, I haven't already obtained them. I haven't already obtained them. So Paul's saying, I haven't already obtained knowing Christ, not fully. I haven't attained the power of the resurrection. I haven't fully attained participation in his sufferings. I haven't attained becoming like him in his death, and I have not yet attained the resurrection from the dead. There's so many things that I'm looking forward to, things that I'm striving for, but things that I haven't pulled off yet. He's halfway through the journey. He's still on the road, still driving. He's still got five more minutes. 
Moving on into verses 13 and 14, Paul gives us an image that's actually pretty similar to our road trip image, so let's, let's read. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, it gets lost in translation a little bit here. But the words that Paul uses here in Koine, the ones that are being translated into English, are often words used to describe like a sprinter, a runner. So he says, forgetting what is behind, straining towards, or running towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize. Here's the image that Paul's giving us. Imagine that you're a runner. For some of you, that's easy. For some of you, you're like, I haven't run in 15 years. That's okay. I haven't run since the beginning of quarantine. It's starting to show. We're all in this together. But uh, imagine for a moment, you know, it's however long ago that you, that you last ran, and, and you're running a race. You're running a 100-meter sprint, right? And you're 50 meters in. What are you thinking about? 50 meters into the race, what, what's your focus on? The finish line. You're thinking about the finish line. You know what you're not thinking? You're not thinking, man, I wish I had a better block start. You're not thinking, oh man, I'm kicking everyone's butt right now, I can slow down a little bit. You're not thinking that. You're thinking, I need to get to the finish line. I need to get there as fast as possible. I need to beat my personal record. I need to get to the goal, right? You're thinking about what's ahead. You are not thinking about what's behind. There's time after the race to think about how things went. Right now, you're just trying to win. And Paul is giving that kind of image. He's saying, if you're a sprinter, you focus on the remainder of your journey. You're focused on that last four hours of the road trip. You're focused on that five more minutes. You're not focused on what's already occurred. That's in the past. You can process that later. You are focused on reaching the goal. And Paul says, like a sprinter, we should be focused on reaching the finish line. Like my dad on those road trips, we should be focused on getting to Cleveland, right? We should be focused on attaining knowledge of Christ on understanding what it means to suffer with him. We should be focused on getting closer to the goal. But here's something interesting. Paul says, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Let's think about who Paul is for a second. Paul was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, or at least a junior member of the Sanhedrin, someone who would have taken a seat. Now, from what we know from extra-biblical traditions and from the Bible itself, it is likely, if not certain, that Paul was married. Interestingly, in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the letters that he writes, Paul refers to himself as not being married, which means one of two things. Either his wife left him, or she died. More likely, she left him when he converted. That's the most likely scenario. Not necessarily what happened, but the most likely scenario is he lost his spouse because he converted to Christianity. We know that was a common practice amongst the Jews. If one spouse converted, the other one was given leave to abandon their spouse. After all, the Jewish religious leaders would have considered him to be a heretic and a traitor. Now, some things that we know about Paul for certain, in addition to that, he was a leader in the early church and would have given up a lot of status as a Jewish leader, a leader of an accepted and established religion, in order to join this sect so many considered to be troublesome and heretical. Moreover, he probably would have lost all of his endowments, all of his wealth when he converted and began traveling throughout Europe. In fact, we see throughout Paul's life that he's rather poor when we know members of the Sanhedrin tended to be rather wealthy. He would have lost a lot of money because of his decision to follow Jesus. On top of that, we see him imprisoned multiple times, beaten, stoned, and left for dead, and eventually he is executed for his faith. Now, with that image of Paul in mind, we figure this guy qualifies as a pretty good Christian, right? Doesn't he? He qualifies as a pretty good Christian. I think he does. And Paul says that even he has not yet taken hold of it, does not yet fully understand Christ, has not yet fully participated in his sufferings, has not yet attained resurrection from the dead. He's not there yet. Paul's saying, even for me, got five more minutes. I haven't made it to the finish line. I'm not in Cleveland yet. Five more minutes. Paul's still on his road trip. So I imagine, I imagine if the Apostle Paul, who wrote so much of our New Testament, who's such an amazing example of the faith, if even Paul has not attained it yet, you and I probably haven't either, right? 
And that's kind of the point he's making to the Philippians here. Don't think that you're done. Don't think there's nothing left to improve. Don't think there isn't an area of your life that Jesus is calling you to change. Because if even Paul hasn't made it yet, neither have we. So forget what you've already accomplished. Forget what's behind. Strain towards what is ahead. Push on towards a goal. Find somewhere that Jesus is calling you to change your life. You're still on the road trip. You're still driving. You've still got five more minutes. Paul finishes up this passage this way. He says, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. I love how sassy Paul sounds here. Because imagine, imagine you're like having a disagreement with someone, right? Like you're having a disagreement with like, like your spouse or your sibling, right? Having a disagreement with someone close to you. And they look at you and they say, you know, all of us who are mature, (laughs) yikes, that'd make me mad. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. I'm not sure if that's what Paul is trying to do, but man, it comes off a little cocky, doesn't it? But it's a valid point. If you've been walking with Christ long enough, this shouldn't come as a surprise to you. If you have been walking with Jesus, if you understand how the things of the kingdom work, you understand that you will not be perfect in this life. There's still a finish line you have not crossed yet. You know how we know that? Because you're still here. You haven't crossed the finish line. you still got 50 more meters, five more minutes. You haven't made it to Cleveland yet. All of us who are mature should take such a view. And if on point, some point you think differently, that too God will make clear for you. That also like comes off as a little cocky. Like, if you disagree with me, God will sort you out. <laughs> Man, Paul's on a roll. But again, I think he actually has a point. If on some point you think differently, if on some point you disagree with what is true, either knowingly or unknowingly, at some point in the future when Jesus returns, you will be taught better. I like to refer to uh, the new creation, call it the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth as I preach. I try to tie that in as often as I can. I often describe it as a time when Jesus will come back and he'll fix the earth and there'll be no sin, no death, and no pain, right? You've heard me say that phrase a couple of times. No sin, no death, and no pain. There's an aspect of it that maybe I should mention a little bit more often. It's not going to be like we're all in white robes and we're all just singing hallelujah and like that's not, that's not a full, that's not a complete picture of what the Bible says the new heavens and the new earth will be like. One way that we can understand a little bit better what the new heavens and the new earth will be like is to go back and look what life was like before sin. So Adam and Eve, before Genesis chapter 3, what was their life like? Well, they were put in the garden to work. They were put in the garden to work. So there'll be work in the new creation. They walked face to face with God, and so we'll be face to face with God in the new creation. So yes, there's no sin. There's no death. There's no pain. There's meaningful work. There's meaningful work, something that God designed people to do in the garden. People partnered with God in order to subdue the earth. That's the order that God gives to Adam, right? Subdue the earth and fill it. They partnered with God to rule over the earth. And I believe the new creation will be much like that. The people will be able to exist the way that God meant them to exist. And part of that means having a full and complete knowledge of Christ a full and complete knowledge of all the things that God is trying to communicate to us in the Bible, but we so often mess up. So when Paul says, if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. He's saying when Jesus comes back, he's going to look at you and he's going to say, you were wrong about some things. Let me teach you better. He's going to say that to each one of you. He's going to say that to me. He's going to say it to your favorite televangelist. He's going to say it to your neighbor. He's going to say it to anyone else who's there. He's going to say, hey, there's a few things that you were wrong about, but let, let 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 me make it clear to you. And if he hasn't yet corrected all of your theology, if you aren't correct about everything, if you don't live perfectly in every aspect of your life, you haven't reached the finish line yet, you're still on your road trip, you got five more minutes, you haven't made it to Cleveland. In the meantime, let us live up to what we have already attained. Whatever knowledge you have, whatever God has revealed to you, whatever you see in Scripture, live up to that. Strain towards the goal. Ultimately, the message of this passage on the whole is we're still driving. We haven't made it. 
we're still driving. We'll get there sooner or later. One day, we'll be with Jesus. He'll return, and we'll be able to look at each other and say, man, we finally crossed the finish line. We finally finished the road trip. But that day isn't today. So in the meantime, there's still things you need to identify and things that you need to work on. And I can't tell you what each one of you needs to work on individually. I don't know all of you that well. But there's one thing that I imagine many of us need to work on. Because I know it's something I need to work on that I want to draw specific attention to today. And that is the practice of evangelism. The practice of evangelism is something that I think the vast majority of Christians in the U.S., like I said, including myself, need to work on. But also, evangelism is downright terrifying. Isn't it? It's scary. You don't want people to think that you're a freak. You don't want people to reject you. You don't want to offend anyone. It's, it's kind of a scary proposition. So for Ian, we've decided that, well, it's hard to do individually. Evangelism is something that's a lot easier to do when you have a little bit of a safety net, a little bit of a support group. And so we decided that each month we are going to have an outreach or an evangelism ministry. Somewhere in the community, we're going to go out and we're just going to find a way to make someone's life better, to address a need or just to be kind. And in that process, we're going to hope for an opportunity. We're going to pray for an opportunity to make people aware of the gospel message. Now, some of these are just going to be, hey, Berean loves you. Here you go. Some of these are going to be opportunities for us to go much deeper with individuals in the gospel message, go much deeper in evangelizing. But we're doing it as a group. And honestly, it makes it a lot easier. It makes it a lot less scary. And it does mean that if someone gets angry at you or is offended or whatever, you have your family and your friends there with you to make it easier. Now, we had a little bit of a delay, but we were finally able to do our first ministry actually just the other day. Uh, here's some pictures that we snapped. We went over to St. Joseph uh, Hospital, and we just handed out cards. It was that simple. Some of you guys actually helped us fill out cards. People that, that weren't there uh, helped us fill out some of these cards. And uh, the cards just had a little message. Hey, thank you for serving us during the pandemic. Thank you for your bravery. Thank you for all the wonderful things you've done for our community. I uh, had a little card in there just letting them know who Berean is. And uh, another little card that gave them a free drink over at I Am Java. Because if anyone deserves caffeine right now, it's our medical workers. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's all it is. It's as simple as that. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit more intense, a little bit more in-depth. Sometimes it's going to be this simple. But we're going to go out and we're going to evangelize as a group because we believe that that safety net is valuable. And in the process, we can learn that evangelism doesn't always have to be terrifying. It's something that we can work on. It's something we can grow in and get better at. There's ways that we can strive towards the finish line. If we haven't made it yet, if we still got five more minutes in our road trip, I imagine evangelism is one area where we can improve, right? So we want to provide that opportunity here at Berean. Like you guys might have heard, we're doing an outreach involving the food pantry and hygiene products uh, this month. If you want to learn more about that, hey, give us a call. It's another opportunity for us to reach out into our community. Of course, there's plenty of other ways that we might need to reach out into our community. There's plenty of other ways that we might need to grow as an individual, but ultimately the point of this passage is what? We're still driving, we got to improve. we got to strive. We've got to reach towards the goal. We haven't made it to Cleveland yet. So can I pray for you guys? Lord, Lord, we come to you today because we love you. We want to be more like you. We want to live out your word more faithfully. So God, whether the area we need to improve in is still one of those big things you drew our attention to when we first came to you, or whether it's something smaller, something harder to notice, whether it's evangelism or some virtue that we don't possess that you would have us develop, whether it's our study of scripture, our ability to pray, or our willingness to disciple others, whatever it is that you want us to work on, God, I ask that you make every individual here or with us online aware of at least one thing that we need to work on, one thing that we need to improve to be more like you and to honor you more in our lives. And God, I ask that you give us the perseverance necessary to change these things, the knowledge of your word necessary to, to build the foundation we need to develop as Christians, as followers of you. And God, I ask that you would give this community, this church, the strength and the love and the wisdom needed to help one another as we strive towards the finish line, as we go through the last five minutes of our journey where you would have us be. Lord, we love you. Thank you for putting up with our imperfections and help us to glorify you more tomorrow than we did today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.